morning good morning christ center kingdom ministries we welcome you we're so glad that you're here this sunday morning thank you so much for joining us thank you for allowing us to do life with you Thank you for allowing us to come into your homes, your businesses, your vehicles, wherever you may be. We're so glad to be connected. Listen, we may be apart, but we are not alone. And so God is faithful. God is consistent. God is holy. God is just. And so we're just so glad that we're able to dig into the word of God together. Listen, I'm Prophetess Makiba and my husband, our senior leader of Christ Center Kingdom Ministries. He is our senior leader and his name is Pastor Mike. And so on behalf of Christ Center Kingdom Ministries, we want to invite our CCKM family. We thank you for your commitment to Jesus. We thank you for being such a loving family and we decree and declare, listen, we care and you matter and so we're so glad you're here we're glad that if this is your first time tuning in to christ center kingdom ministries welcome we're glad you're here and so we want you to know that christ center kingdom ministries is not just the name of our church but it is our position in christ we are a house that is marked by the presence of god and we're so glad that you're here well we're going to get into the word of God on today. And so we've been talking about the reality, uh, the battle of two realities, right? We've been in a series where we've been really talking and sharing in the word of God. And on Wednesday, we uh, for our Bible study, we had the opportunity to talk about the power of decisions, the power of decisions. Listen, get your Bible get your laptops get your electronic devices whatever you take notes on and whatever you read your Bible and your scripture on we're going to be going to the book of Deuteronomy we're going to start there and then we're going to move over to Luke 15 we're going to move there and so I just want to encourage you to follow along in the word of God. A lot of times you will hear me even encourage you to read the scripture out loud. Why? Because faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you begin to literally take the word of God and you begin to speak it, you begin to release it in your atmosphere of your home, your car, your business, wherever you are, what happens is the atmosphere begins to shift because the word of God is what? It's alive. The word of God is powerful. The word of God is operative. The word of God, listen, it's eternal and it'll begin to shift things and cause the atmosphere in your home to literally, or wherever you are, it'll begin to cause it to change. What does the word of God says? It says that the word of God, just the entrance of it will bring light. It will bring illumination, right? So when you begin to speak the word of God, you're going to begin to see the manifestations of the word of God. My prayer today is that, listen, God make the Bible real to me. Come on. The, may God make the Bible real to you. May it be animated. May it come alive. May you begin to see the word today in three dimensions that you'll understand is just not what you see on the pages or on the screen, but the word of God is alive. Why? Because Jesus himself is the word of God. You know at Christ Center Kingdom Ministries, we teach you that the truth is not just a concept it's a person it's the person of jesus well let's engage god come on let's engage god together let's pray let's seek him and then we're going to dive into the word of god father in the name of jesus we come before your throne, O oh God, to acknowledge you. Father, we place value upon your presence, Jesus. We invite you to teach us, to train us, to perfect us, to equip us. We invite you. Even today, we set our eyes on you. We set our affection on things above and not on things of this earth. Father, we begin to look up unto you. Father, we thank you today as we dive into your word. 
word. You're going to enlighten the eyes of our understanding and allow us to see something we have never seen. You're going to allow us to encounter you, the living God, and draw us into a fresh reality of who you are. We thank you today, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher, so teach us. We yield to you, Holy Spirit, and give you unlimited access that you can draw us into a realm of revelation that we've never possessed before. We thank you that you are the God that does nothing, oh God. Oh, Rapasa, outside of your word. We thank you today that your word is life. Your word is a lamp. Your word, oh God, is a lamp unto our feet and becomes a light or a guide, oh God, to our, the path we are to take. We thank you today, God, that blinded eyes will open, deaf ears will hear, oh God, the broken heart will be mended. Father, we thank you today for the heavy oil of the Holy Ghost that falls upon even our minds that's going to begin to cause us to think, oh God, in the level that you have called us to think on. We love your genius. We love your brilliance. And we thank you today, God, that you're going to divinely begin to download things, oh God, that have been hidden up until this moment. And we thank you and we bless you and we invite you, Holy Ghost. We invite you, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for every home that's represented today every person that's going to watch the replay, that God, you're going to do something fresh. You're going to give them a custom-made rhema, of God. You're going to speak to them. You're going to change them. You're going to align them, God, because why? You care about them. And Father, today, we thank you for your compassion. We thank you for being full of compassion. Oh, we thank you for being gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. We bless you, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go. You're going to Deuteronomy 30. And here we're going to see how God is such an awesome God and how he causes us to see things through the light of his word. All right. Let's go. I believe today that God is going to recalibrate some of our thinking. I believe that, that God is going to literally cause our minds to be enlightened to the place where we're going to begin to make choices and decisions according to the will of God. So let's go to Deuteronomy 30, okay? And then let's start at verse 19. It says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you. Oh my God. I have set before you what? Life and death, blessings and curses. I have therefore choose life that both you and thy seed may live. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified, okay, as well. I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you that I have set before you what? Life and death the blessings and the curses therefore choose life that you and your descendants may live verse 20 and may love the lord your god and obey his voice and cling to him for he is your life the length of your days that you may dwell in the land which the lord swore to give your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Come on, we said that God is the God of generations. He's not just the God that cares about you, but he cares about, listen, I, this is how I pray when I pray. And uh, one of the things I've learned when I pray, I can't pray for play. When I pray, I pray for real. But when I'm praying and I begin to pray even for my own household, I begin to come before the Lord and I just begin to lift up and I just begin to tell him, God, you're the God of Mike and Makiba. God. You're the God of Malcolm, Miracle, Joshua, Felicia, and Alani. I just began to remind God who he is in our lives. I began to decree and I began to establish who God is as I began to know that he's the God of the generations. And so the generational blessings started with Mike and I. Listen, and then it goes to our children and then it goes to our children's children. And so I love how the scripture brought that out, that he was going to 
Give the land which he has swore to give your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can I tell you, there's not just generational curses. There's a thing called generational blessings. And God wants us to move into what? Generational blessings. And so when you look at this scripture, it says, I have called heaven and earth to record this day that I'm literally setting before you choices and decisions every day. Day, all of us have to make choices and decisions. And so it's important that when we make choices and decisions, that we understand that God is a big God. Hallelujah. And so God always has something bigger in mind. He always has good in mind for you. Why? Jeremiah 29 and 11 said unto us that he's thinking about you. He's thinking about me and his thoughts are what? They're good. And so when Whenever we start talking about making decisions, when we start talking about making wise choices and decisions, it's important that we understand that God loves us so much that he has allowed us to be free moral agents, right? Listen, in the book of Genesis, when we begin to look, when God, after God created the atmosphere for Adam, so the atmosphere was created before man. God created the atmosphere in which he would dwell in, in which he would thrive in and flourish in. And then he created the man. And the scripture says that he created us. And then he gave us what? Choices. And he set before us choices. And he said, listen, I'm going to tell you what to do. The same thing he just said right here. He said, listen, I need you to choose life that you and your seed might live. And I love that because he doesn't just tell you what to choose. He tells you why to choose it. He says, if you want to live, not just exist, not just survive, if you want to live, you're going to have to choose my way. You're going to have to choose to be obedient. And so that's what the scripture tells us. He not only tells you to choose life so that you and your seed might live, but in verse 20, he says, I'm going to tell you what life really looks like. And he says that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou may obey his voice and you may cling unto him. Those are three different um, three different principles, three different things that you need to do in order if you're going to enter into living the God kind of life. The Bible tells us that there's a specific type of life that God wants us to live. And one of the things that he began to tell us is that, listen, he says, you got, you have a thief. There is a thief according to John 10 and 10. He says, I want you to be aware of something, that you have a real enemy that's after your destiny. You have a real enemy that's after after your decisions. You have a real enemy that's trying to come after you and he's a thief and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I decree and declare that even on today that the enemy will no longer hijack the thoughts of God that God has been downloading to you and no more will he cause interference in the realm of your ability to perceive what God is saying. I believe today prophetically that God is going to call your ears to be open in a new way and that you're going to hear on another frequency on another level because God is speaking and God wants us to know that his thoughts listen he wants you to have his thoughts because he tells us let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So we thank you, God, that he has this, this desire towards us that our thoughts would line up with his thoughts. In Isaiah, this is what he says to us. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. He said, my ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens is above the earth, so are my thoughts. In other words, you're going to have to do what? Think up. You're going to have to come up in how you're thinking. You're going to have to allow God to elevate your thinking. And so the scripture told us, he said, that if you're going to live the type of life that God has created for you to live, he says, you're going to have to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. That That's according to, I believe, Matthew 22. And Matthew 22 and 37, it said, love the Lord your God with what? All of your heart, all of your might, all of your strength, all of your mind, right? 
In other words, your thought life is going to have to love God. You're going to have to begin to regulate the thoughts that are coming in and out of your mind because God says that he wants us to love him okay wholeheartedly so choosing life involves wholehearted commitment right amen and so we thank the father for his word then he says number two he says you're going to have to obey my voice if you love me keep my commandments right he said listen when i speak to you i need you to do what i say do listen if you're going to truly live the abundant kind of life where the scripture said in john 10 and 10 i'm finishing my complete thought of that that jesus said you got a thief that came to steal kill and destroy he said but i'm on the scene too and i've come that you might have life but there's a specific type of life that i desire for you to live and he says this type of life is the Abundant, the Zoe kind of life that I want you to step into a realm of living. I believe so many of us have been focused on surviving the moment that we never allowed ourselves to be healed. I'm going to say that again. I believe so many of us, uh, when we have fallen into situations and unexpected events have happened and we've uh, found ourselves, uh, some people have lost their jobs or they've lost loved ones uh, or they lost their pension or their 401k. Some people have uh, went to work and listen, found out that they were downsized and listen, in the airline industry, they've been downsized and some people that thought that they were going to be furloughed discovered that now they're being totally um, laid off and their jobs are no longer available and when you find yourself and you hit places like that it's important that you know the word of God and that you are rooted and grounded on the solid foundation of the word because in a world that is forever changing can I tell you about a God that does not change he changes not listen hallelujah the Bible says that he is the father Father of light and there is no shadows of turning in him in other words there's no shadows or darkness variations listen he's consistent in who he is he is constant and so it's important that we know that God remains the same even when things change I love it I love that his not only does he not change his word is forever settled oh my god he said the grass will wither and the flower will fade but his word will stand his word will remain why because his word is eternal and if he spoke it it is sure and he says that he watches over his own word and does what hasten to perform it go with me so we talked about that we talked about how living is a part of living is choosing to love God with all of your heart to obey the voice of God and to cling to him listen that's John 15 if if you abide in me my god if you remain in me if you continue in me if you continue to journey with me if you continue to do life with me he said listen if you um if you abide in me and my word abide in you he said then you are my disciples indeed he said if you abide in me and i in you because i am the true vine if you stay connected to me you're going to flourish and that's why i was saying so many times many of us have been so overly consumed in surviving the moment that we never took the moment to heal and God is a God of healing he's a God that completes the work that he began and he's the God that's going to heal you listen you may have experienced grief you may have experienced some degree of loss some people have lost limbs some people have lost marriages some people have lost relationships and so we the Bible tells us we got a thief and he does come against us but he says listen be encouraged because I'm on the scene too and I'm here to give you what type of life abundant life and so when you think about the abundant life let's go to Luke 15 okay go with me to Luke 15 and you guys know I have my Bible if you've been following any time you know I have my Bible 
And I want to talk a little bit about a familiar story, but I don't want you to gloss over the scripture. Come on, we're about to do some work. I don't want you to um, begin to um, come up with ideas and thoughts of where what God is going to say to you today, but allow God to breathe upon the prodigal son, to breathe upon this passage of scripture and open it up. May you see yourself in the scripture today. And so here, this is a familiar passage of scripture. And and we know that this is Jesus beginning to give us a parable. And so throughout this whole entire chapter, Jesus is dealing with um, laws. He's dealing with laws. And so this is so important. I believe it's important because it's going to deal with the abundant mindset versus scarcity, a mindset of scarcity, okay? And so as you see in verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided it unto them his living amplified. And he said, there was a certain man who had two sons and the younger of them said to the father, father, give me the part of the property that falls to me. Ah, and he divided the estate between them. And not many days after that, the younger son gathered up all that he had and journeyed into a distant country. Okay. He didn't just move away. He moved away very far. Okay. And so he distant, he went into the distant country and there he wasted his fortune in reckless and loose oh my goodness from restraint living and when he had spent all he had my god when he had spent all that he had when he had spent his entire inheritance when he had spent Spent all that his father had given unto him. Oh my God, there came a severe, a what kind of famine? It was a mighty famine. What kind of famine? It was a severe famine that came upon the country and he began to fall behind and be in want. What he began to fall behind and be in want. This word is so relevant. This word is so current because after the pandemic happened, many people found themselves in what we would call a famine, in what we would call a severe economic, oh my God, failure. What we would see here, put yourself in the scripture. And it says that in other words, he began to fall behind on his bills. He began Began to fall behind on the things that he normally would have been able to keep up with. Why? Because prior to the famine, God had provided a certain amount. Listen, God had provided for some of us. God provided before the COVID had hit, but because we were like the prodigal son who made bad choices and decisions in a season of abundance, in a season of fruitfulness, and we became like the prodigal. The prodigal, the definition of prodigal means to be wasteful. It means to have lavish spending. It means to, uh, to have riotous type of living. In other words, you've got to be careful that you don't live for just the moment. Because when you live for just the moment, what happens is you never prepare for the future. And so Satan understands if I could lock you up into a realm of living based upon pleasure and comfortability and never allow you to see past today, then I know that I can cause a setup. Come on, I can set you up. And, and when the famine comes, you're not going to have that which you need. And now you're going to find yourself in what? In want. Now you're going to find yourself in need, right? And so it says, now all of a sudden he didn't fail behind and he is in want. So he went and force glued himself upon one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the hogs. I'm going to finish this. Verse 16, and he would gladly have fed on and filled his belly with the paws that the hogs were eating, but they could not satisfy his hunger. Nobody gave him anything better. 
Then when he came to himself, come on, we're going to make another choice and a decision. Aren't you glad that we serve a God of many chances? Aren't you glad that even though you've made a decision and times pass, it's okay because we serve a God that gives us an opportunity to change our mind. Somebody put in the comments, change your mind. It's okay to change your mind. If you have walked into a situation and you realize that after you made a decision and you stepped into that relationship blindly, you stepped into that business partnership blindly, you stepped into buying that home without doing reconnaissance and you did not gather the facts, you did not do your homework, you stepped into it because we told you bad decisions is usually based upon your emotions, it's based upon your feelings, it's usually based upon speculation. You looked at her and she was beautiful. You looked at him and he was handsome and he was saying everything that you wanted to hear. And then all of a sudden, or oh, you look, listen, you were longing for covenant. You were longing for a mentor. You was longing for a friendship. You were longing for someone to mother you. Maybe you lost your mother as a child and you were looking for somebody that would just be a mother figure. And all of a sudden you make a decision to get into a relationship. And what happens is if you're not careful, you can get and enter into relationships blindly. And this could be devastating to you because the scripture said that now the prodigal son has become one with the citizens of this new country that he didn't join. And so now he's a part of something he's never been a part of. And I'm going to tell you that it was below the level of living that he once lived. How do I know? Because Jews had no dealing with hogs. Jews had no dealing with swine. Listen, he was living be beneath uh, his core values. Anytime you have to lower your standards, it's the wrong decision. Anytime you've got to convince yourself that it's not that bad, it's really bad. Anytime you have to talk yourself into it, Listen, you need to know that that's a red flag and maybe you shouldn't be doing it. So I want to encourage you because we can draw from his life and we can see his decision-making skills have now led him to the place that he's living in. Can I decree and declare to you that you are not a victim of your circumstances? God has given you the power and the freedom of choice and you can choose to walk right back out of that situation. If you went through the wrong door, turn around. I'm not playing with y'all today. Turn around and walk right back through that door. Because if the enemy can get you locked into that place, he knows that everything that God has for you now has began to be what? It, you, you're stuck now. He knows that if I can get you all entangled up in the rim of your emotions, in the rim of your soul, if I can get you to make a decision, listen, a short-term decision that's going to affect you long-term. I want to encourage you today that when you get ready to make a choice and decision, could you please slow down? Can you slow down? Uh, I, I, was teaching my, I was teaching my child and I was saying to her, I said, listen, don't push past the pause. Don't push past the pause. Each one of us, when we go to make a decision, usually if you're in tune with God, and even if you're not because he's so sovereign and it is his will that you, oh my God, prosper and be in good health, the Father will begin to give you, listen, he'll begin to give you a check in your spirit. And you'll begin to feel like, mm, I, I don't know what it is, but I can't really put my finger on it right now, but I, I just don't feel good about it. Uh, you begin to feel that pause, don't don't push past the pause. Can I ask you a real question? When you see a yellow light, how do you process that? What is your thinking process? Do you see a yellow traffic light? And when you see it, do you speed up or do you slow down? Come on here. Because this is going to determine 
What's going to happen afterwards? And a lot of times when we see the yellow light, the yellow light means slow down. A change is about to take place. And I'm going to need you to stop because I don't want you to get into a wreck. I don't want you to get into a car accident. I don't want you to go through a lane or be in the middle of a lane when it is not your turn. I don't want you to miss your set timing. I said something. I don't want you to miss your set Timing. When you look at the prodigal son, listen, his inheritance, the property belonged, it rightfully belonged to him, but he was out of timing. Ah, uh, it wasn't time for him to get his inheritance. It wasn't time for him to get the property. It wasn't time for him to handle and, and manage that amount of money. Ah, uh, how do I know it wasn't time? Ah, uh, because he comes to the father premature and he comes and he has no plan in place for the money. He has no, listen, he has not sat down and he has not come up with a budget. He has not come up with what is this money assigned for? What is this money supposed to do? And uh, now the scripture says, that listen, he began to begin to do things that was riotous. He began to do and live as if there was no tomorrow. A part of marking you as a mature person is that you don't just live for the moment, but you understand that you're living for those that come behind you. And when you understand that you're living not just for you and not just for yourself alone, then you begin to set up an inheritance for those to come behind you. I'm talking to grown-ups here. I'm talking to adults. I'm talking to those that, that really understand that life is not really about you. It's about what God put you in the earth to do. And so he has missed his timing. Just because he had an inheritance didn't mean he was supposed to take it and spend it. But he's living in the moment of pleasure. Can I tell you the danger of sin? Can we talk about the dangers of sin? Usually sin make you go faster than you really want to go. And it takes you farther than you really want to go. And before you know it, you're somewhere living in the, the pig's bin. You, you didn't laugh living in luxury in the house of your father. And now because of your choices and decisions, you have found yourself ah, in a place that you don't, it's against your dietary restriction. Listen, you don't even eat this kind of food. You don't even mingle with this kind of people. And that's the danger, that one of the dangers of sin is separation. And so we understand if Satan can separate you, if he can get you to get disconnected from what God has for you, then he knows if I could just get them to move out of the timing of God, I, I can derail them. If I can get them anxious and, and get them nervous and, and, and get them emotional and they begin to make decisions out of their emotions, they're no longer being led by the Spirit of God. But the Word of God said this. He said, they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? They are the sons of God. When you look at that word son, it denotes maturity. And so here we see the young son uh, was not mature enough to manage his mood, to manage his money. Come on here, to manage his time. And so you got to be careful because what does uh, the prodigal son look like in your life? It looks like um, wasting your time, wasting your talent, wasting your energy, wasting the opportunities God has set before you. You can't even discern the opportunity because you're so busy caught up in what you want. And you begin to, if you're not careful, the spirit of pride says, I want what I want when I want it. Those are dangerous words right there. You're heading for a collision whenever you allow your appetite to dictate how fast you go. And so now, not did, listen, the scripture said he didn't just leave uh, um, and go down to the other town. He didn't just he didn't even go to the neighboring city. The scripture says he went far from home. See, that's how I know. But decisions and choices, oh my God, our life is a sum of decisions, decisions and choices. And so this is why we've got to stop and we've got to say, Father, I need your help. Whenever we get ready to make a decision, we must consult with God. We must consult with God. Keys with key. 
you must consult with God, right? We've got to consult with God. We have to, and we have to not only consult with God, we got to consult with his word. Because here's what I've learned, real life talk. I've learned that whatever you need, whatever the issue you're facing, the word has the answer. Whatever you are facing, the word has the answer. Whatever you're going through, the word has your way out. Whatever you are, my God, experiencing, the word has your way out. Out. And so this is why the scripture says that the word is what? It's a lamp unto your what? Your feet. In other words, God will shine upon the path that you should go in. If you consult him, my God, and if you, oh God, involve him, he steps into your situation. And the Bible says that he would guide us. The Bible said it. I believe this is Psalms 119. When he begins to say that the, the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In other words, I'm going to guide you to the in the path that you should take, but I'm going to need you to acknowledge me. Isn't this something that Satan got Adam and Eve to forfeit the entire garden? That's what I mean, how sin is going to take you faster than you want to go and further than anything you can imagine. Why? Because they never imagined when they disobeyed God and made the wrong choice that it will cause them to be evicted out of the atmosphere that God created. No, Satan didn't show them any of that. He showed them one tree that God said, for your own sake, I need you to choose what I'm choosing for you and trust that when I choose it for you, I'm a good father and I'm not trying to keep nothing from you but I'm trying to get everything to you and I want you to never experience death. But because your decision has caused death, not to just affect you, Adam and Eve, because your decisions don't just affect you. It affects everybody connected to you. And so when he made and Adam and Eve made the choice, this is what God said. He came and he said, Adam, where are you? And uh, Adam began to hide, the scripture said. Come on. Seeing all, you always know if you've made a bad choice and decision based on your reaction when God comes close. He said, I hid myself because I am naked. And what did God say? Who have been talking to you? Who have you been listening to? And he said, ah. And so now all of a sudden, ah, the one who was never afraid of God is now fearful. See that? You see? Because when you open the door, when, when we sin, what we do is we open the door for demonic activity. And so I don't want to open up the door for demonic activity. That's why the Bible said, he said that if you're going to choose life, he said there's a few things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to make a decision to become a committed lover to me. You're going to have to dedicate your heart to me. And I'm going to need you to love me with your whole heart. I'm going to need you to make a decision to obey me. When you hear me speak, obey what I say. And, and, and then he says, and then I'm going to need you to cling. I'm going to need you to be intentional about spending time with me. I'm going to need you to be intentional. Can I say this to you? That intimacy is not situational, it's relational. I'm going to say it again. Intimacy is not situational, it's relational. I don't go to God just when things go wrong. I don't go to God when unexpected events happen. No, no, my intimacy is not based on situations. It's based on relationship. And so he was saying, you're going to have to have intimacy with me. You're going to have to spend time with me. Any relationship that you're in, I don't care what kind it is, you must give unto it the proper time and attention in order for it to be healthy. My God. And so here we see, now he's with the swine, right? He's not only with the swine. Listen, 
the scripture says, and he was fain and was filled and filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, come on, somebody come to yourself. He said, how many higher servants of my father have bread enough to spare and I perish for hunger? Come on, God. Thank you, Father, for awakening the eyes of our understanding. Come on, this is an awakening. He said, listen, he said, the servants are living better than me. He said, my God. He said, and when he came to himself, he began to understand that the servants was living better than he was. And then when he came to himself, he said, my, the many higher servants of my father have enough food, even food to spare. But I'm perishing. I'm literally dying here of hunger. When you come to yourself, you begin to be very honest. So he had to begin to be honest. You've got to be honest about where you really are because God is not intimidated by your situation or circumstances, but he needs you to turn. There's got to be a point of turning. Listen, listen, things don't change physically first. First things change mentally. Things don't change physically first. They change mentally. He had to first come to himself. Come on, Holy Ghost. Call some of us to come to ourselves. He had to get him to a place where he would make a decision. Listen, the first, listen, you've got to make the decision. Decision is the first point of changing your situation. The decision is the first place and the first point where you change your situation. It is until you make up your mind that I'm tired of this. It is when you make the decision, I'm no longer going to be a victim. I'm a victor. It's when you make the decision, you're not going to hit me not another time. When you begin to stand up and say, this is not my inheritance. This is not my poor. This is not what the father had in mind. Abuse. God never had abuse in mind when he created woman. My God, he had dominion in mind when he created her. He created he them in his image and in his likeness, and he gave them both dominion. Ooh. He said, but I'm going to need you to obey me, and I'm going to need you to follow me. Can I give you a real testimony? A real testimony. So Pastor Mike and I was recently, we were going to take care of business and we were in two different vehicles. Come on, I'm going to share my life with you. And so we were in two different vehicles. And Mike was ahead of me and I was following him. And so uh, we were going to a place that I was familiar with. I knew where it was, I was familiar with it, but my husband is in front of me and he's using his GPS. And so initially as we're getting to the place where I can see the place, I know exactly what corner it sits on, I know where it's located, I began to blow because I was trying to get Mike's attention so that he could get in the lane and follow me to the place. Now mind you, I'm in the car behind him. I'm the one following. Listen to me and hear me clearly. All of a sudden, this is why you have to put the word of God in your heart. All of a sudden it came to me and I began to talk to myself and I began to say, Mike is the head of my household and I will follow him. Mike wasn't in the car. Mm -mm. Come on, I'm going to help somebody today. He was in another car and he was leading. And as he was leading, he looked like it looked like he was going in a, the wrong direction. It looked like he was about to make a wrong turn. But I began to yield. Come on. I began to submit. I began to acquiesce my own will. I had to bring my own intelligence under. Come on, sub, sub, mission. Come on, I had to come under the mission. I had to choose to allow my husband. Can I help some women today? Can I help those that are out there? And maybe you have not, uh, maybe you're waiting to be married or maybe you're married. But I'm telling you, if you're going to ever walk into mastery, you're going to have to practice. If you're ever going to walk in mastery, you're going to have to practice. If you're ever going to walk in mastery,
mastery, you're going to have to practice. So I'm in the car practicing submission. I've been married to this man 23 years, going on 24 years, and I'm still actively putting forth an effort to follow. Come on. I understood that if God allowed him to be in the car ahead of me, and even if it don't look like he's going the way he should, can I just, my God, be quiet and allow him to lead? I'm in the car, and I mean everything, see your flesh. I know that hits somebody flesh as I'm speaking, but you're going to have to bring that flesh under submission, and you're going to have to learn to obey God, even when you don't understand what he's saying. Listen, he don't have to be understood, but he must be obeyed. And so I'm sitting in the car, and, and I see my husband make this turn, and everything give me, the, everything in my natural realm was saying, girl, just go on over there. He'll get there. And I said, oh no, I'm going to follow. Can I talk to somebody about following Jesus? What does it really look like to follow him? What does it look like to really follow Jesus when you don't understand why he's going to Samaria, disciples? When it's like, why are we going through here? Why? Man, listen, can I tell you about good decision making? You got to be careful about taking shortcuts. Because I had a shortcut. I had another way. I had another route. But listen, I had to be careful about taking shortcuts. And I had to learn. And I literally was telling my soul and my flesh what we were going to do. We're going to follow Pastor Mike. Yeah, we're going to turn. No, you're not going to call him. No, you're not going to pick up the phone and say, baby, you done passed the place. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Hush and follow. Okay, so I was like, okay, I can't call. I can't call. Can't. Okay, just follow. Come on, Key, you got this. Follow him. Oh, my God. And, it, and the GPS took my husband the long way. Oh my God. And as I'm just driving and everything in my flesh is screaming, but I'm, listen, I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to bishop over my soul. I'm allowing the Spirit of God to bishop. I'm allowing, listen, I'm like, God, I choose to follow you. Come on. I choose to obey you, God. And every turn Mike made, I was on, I was on his, on his, on his heels. And it was like, okay, cause guess what? Now I'm in a place. I don't know where I'm at. I'm, I'm in a place that's uncomfortable. I'm in a place that now I got to follow him for real because he done took me off a road that I was familiar with. And now I'm in an unfamiliar territory. And when you get into an unfamiliar territory, it's easy to question authority. When you get in an unfamiliar territory, it's easy to stand up to your father and say, give me what belongs to me. This is rightfully mine. Can I say to you, prodigal son, that's what your father worked for. You didn't work for that. And yet you come demanding, give Give me that which belongs to me. And what I love about the Father God, he says, okay, because you, you are a free moral agent and I'm allowing you to make the choices and decisions you want to make. But even when you make the decision, know that I'm the kind of God that will redeem the time for you because I know that you're going to come to yourself. And when you come to yourself, I didn't already set it up so that you could be forgiven and be restored. I already got restoration in mind and I already knew that the pummel worm and the locusts and the canker worm was about to eat up all your stuff. I knew when you made that decision. I knew when you got into that business deal. I knew when you brought that house that you were going to have a fixer up huh? and you didn't even understand that what you was going to have to fix up was going to cost more than what the house was valued for. Come on here. But we serve a God that has an abundant mindset and that's why he said to them in the garden, you can have all of this and the enemy got them into poverty with a scarcity mentality and said unto them, it's one tree you can't have. Oh my God. God. Don't let the enemy take all that God has for you because he done showed you one thing that don't belong to you. Most of us are in trouble because we're eating stuff that don't belong to us. We're taking things that don't belong to us. Can I get somebody to give it back? Because it don't belong to you. It wasn't time. So the enemy set him up on timing. Wasn't that it wasn't his. He wasn't ready. And so preparation and readiness must collide. And so he goes, he goes, the scripture, you guys know it so well. Oh my God. Can I bring out another point? Woo. Let me bring out another point. They got mad because watch this, watch this. It's something that when you change your mind, how people will get mad. Oh, we watch your circle. Watch your network. When you make a different decision, watch it. And it says, after he came to himself, he said in verse 18, I will get up and go. Who first is the decision? 
I told you that decisions start, listen, I told you that change starts mentally before you see it physically. He had to first come to himself and say, I don't have to live like this. Second, he had to act. Because the real battle between two realities is in the decision making. It's right there when you go to make a decision and say, this relationship is not good for me and I'm going to step away. This is when the warfare begins. This is when the enemy begins to fight your mind and say, listen, but you've been with him all these years. And, and he's what you know. And it's familiar. And the spirit of familiarity begins to imprison you. Or, or fear says, you don't know that land. You, you've never been this way. Don't go that way. Don't trust. Wait a minute. And all of a sudden, your past begins to hold you hostage. But this is the place. Place where you're going to have to act. This is when decision uh, and action must collide. Preparation and readiness must collide. You listen, it's not enough to know you got to get up. You got to literally do it. The man was there for 38 years, 38 years, the scripture said, and Jesus took note of how long he had been lame and how long he had been dysfunctional and how long he had been operating and being handicapped and needing a disability check and needing public assistance and, he, and needing people to help him and listen and being a beggar. Listen, don't you ever be a beggar when God has given you the ability to work. If a man don't work, he don't eat. Who am I talking to? Listen, don't you choose and default to begging when you can do better. All right, keep going. All right. And so, so we see this and we're realizing, okay, Father, okay, how do I make, oh my God, how do I make good choices and decisions? It's going to start with me acknowledging, God, I'm somewhere you never told me to be. Father, I done messed up. I confess my sins. Listen, God, like David, you just got to come clean. Father God, against you and you alone have I sinned. He said, listen, create in me the heart I need. I'm going to need you to create it. I don't even have it. Create in me a clean heart and renew in me the right spirit. Oh, my God, I need the right spirit. I need to make right choices. I need to, come on, I need right relationships. I need righteousness. Come on, I need to be in right standing with you, God. But I'm, I'm going to need you to do a work in me because I realize that I made my own choices and decisions, and it led me here. But when I line up and come in alignment with the thoughts of God, I Oh my God, it's my way out. And so he begins to say all of that, right? And so he makes the decision in verse 18. He said, I will get up and go. Get up and go. Somebody please put that. Satan don't care if you make a decision if you never move on it. He don't care. You can make all the decisions in the world. If you never act on it, you will never move forward. You're going to literally have to get up. Up. That's what Jesus told the lame man. He asked him a question. He said, do you want to make a decision, man? Do you want to be made whole? He would begin to tell him all his excuses. You just don't know, my, you know, my upbringing. And I grew up and, you know, listen, we lived in abandoned houses and we didn't have anything to eat. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. I'm about to change your life forever. I'm going to need you to get up the moment I step on the scene, discern who I am. And when I say, do you want to get well? The question, the answer is, yes, Lord, I want to be, you got to get up and you got to go my god i got to go time is going and to my father and i will say to him father i have sinned against heaven and in your sight and i am no longer worthy to be called your son oh my god but just make me like one of the highest servants you guys know the story the bible says that the father saw him afar off my god and this is the love of the father I came to talk to somebody that have made some bad decisions in your life. Oh my God, you've made some choices and decisions. You said, my God, I'm living with a belly full of regret. I am so sorry that I did what I did. I've come to myself. And anytime you turn your heart to God, listen, he's waiting to give you everything that he always had for you. He has not changed. He remains the same. His faithfulness and his love is steadfast. It does not change. What you've done has not changed how God sees you. What you've done, God's love for you never changes. He says, I'm the same today, yesterday, and forever. I'm the one that's not changing. You changed. I didn't. But the moment we turn back to him, the moment our hearts go back to God, uh, he says, I'm here and I'm going to bring you into another reality. And the reality is, is son, that I'm so glad. I'm so glad you came to yourself. Isn't it something? But then the Bible says that his brother got mad. That's why I said, be careful, those that are mad about your decision to become better. 
those when you begin to make decisions and say, no, you know, I'm not going to drink no more. Girl, come on. You just, now you acting funny. You know, we always celebrated your birthday. You know, every new year we went out. Watch it. Watch it. Because now all of a sudden you'd have made a decision. No, I'm not, I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not with the swine anymore. I'm not giving my pearls to the swine no more. I'm not eating with the swine no more. And, and, and I, oh, you think you better than us. God. No, I'm just trying to think up, man. I'm trying to go up. I'm trying to mount up. I'm trying. I'm, I'm on an upgrade. I'm going somewhere. And so his brother became angry. I want to tell you today that I realized when I read this scripture, not only was the prodigal son lost, but the son in the house was lost. The son outside of the house, house was lost and the son in the house was lost. Oh my God, the son outside of the house was lost, but the son that remained in the house was still lost because he felt that the father's love was based upon his works. He said, Father, I stayed with you. I did not leave. I've worked your fields. I've done everything that was right. Come on, come on, uh, come on. Now he's based on merit, uh, thinking that God loves us based on what we do. God loves you because he is love. God loves you because he created you. Listen, God loves you just because of who he is and who you are. It's not based on works. And so the son in the house was lost and the son that was outside of the house was lost. The scripture says that the son outside of the house, the Bible says that the father ran to him. And the scriptures say for the son that was lost in the house, he stepped out and the father took notice of him and came to him and said, what's wrong? Why? Because the father cares about all the sons, whether you're outside of the house, and, and, oh my God, or you're inside of the house. If you're lost, Jesus says, listen, you may have lost sight of me, but I never lost sight of you. I hope this helped somebody today. I pray that this word helps somebody recalibrate how you're thinking. I pray today that you will begin to consult God when you have to make decisions, not only will you consult God, but you will involve God. And when we do that and we allow him in, he's going to order our steps, right? I pray today that when you make decisions, that you understand that your life, what you do today will affect your future. Can I encourage somebody? People that are dealing with the spirit of depression, they call it hopelessness. And, and the reason they call it that is because you cannot see beyond the moment. I believe that God is going to cause you to see beyond the moment. A lot of times you get paralyzed in the, in the current pain that you cannot see. That weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming. Come on. You can't see the joy that's coming because the enemy has paralyzed you in the pain of today. But the Bible says weeping may endure for a night. It's a temporary situation. Don't you die in the night. Don't you die in that pain. Don't you die in that hurt. Don't you dare commit suicide. Don't you dare give up on life. Don't you dare give up on your marriage. It's what you see is just temporary. He said weeping may endure for a night. He said, but I promise you that brighter days are coming. He said joy is going to come. And if he promised it, it is sure. Don't you allow the enemy to lock you up in hopelessness and cause you not to be able to see that tomorrow everything for you is changing. You're right there. Everything changed for the prodigal son when he came home. Everything changed. And so I say to you, God's got so much more for you. Ah, we not quitting. We not giving up. We not dying premature. We're living and we're going to live the abundant kind of life. Why? Because we're choosing to live. We're choosing life. Well, God bless you. You've been, you've been listening to Christ into kingdom ministries. I pray that you got some keys today, how to make good choices and decisions. The whole story about the prodigal son was about decisions. If you made a bad one, it's okay. We serve a good God that's able to reverse that curse. He's able, listen, to do exceeding abundantly more above all that we could ask or think according to his power that works inside of us. I love you. Listen, it's time to give. Generosity and giving is a choice. 
It's a choice. And so you get an opportunity to give today. You get an opportunity to sow. I pray that this opened a prison door to somebody's mind, that somebody that was enslaved feeling like I blew it, I messed up too bad, there's no hope for me, that you understand that Christ is the hope of glory and that he doesn't have a problem releasing a full rescue operation on your behalf because he'll leave 99 and come after the one. Why? Because you matter. He loves you. God loves you unconditional. That's why it's not based on your efforts. You're not saved by your works. We're saved by grace through faith. And so that's another decision. If you've never made the decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's the greatest decision you can ever make. It's the beginning um, to living. It's the beginning from going from just existing to living. And so we'll begin to live in Christ. And so I want you, if you've never confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's the starting point of changing the rest of your life. And so accept him into your heart. Listen, believe in your heart that Christ was raised from the dead. Oh my God, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You begin to say, Father, I know I've erred. I messed up. I, re I need to repent. It's okay. Come to yourself like the prodigal son. The father is waiting to embrace you. The father is waiting to restore you. Psalms 23 and 3 say he restored my soul. Listen, I want you to give. Give generously because God generously gave his love to us. Make good choices. Make good decisions. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything else shall be added unto to you. Listen, are y'all sending up some love? I need some love. Listen, this is what we do at CCKM. Listen, we pour into those that pour into us, right? And so the way you do it is, listen, you're sending up love. Uh, make a decision to be kind this week. Make a decision to love on somebody. Make a decision that I'm going to be active. I'm going to be committed. I'm going to be dedicated. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Well, I love you. Mwah, mwah. God bless you. Have a beautiful week, and we'll see you Wednesday. God bless.